coming. I'm Garrett Reich, co-chair of the Adult Education Committee here at Aguadat Achim. Uh, today's program is part of our Back to the Basics theme for the year. <clears throat> First part of a six-part program uh, called From Genesis to Sidur Lev Shalem, A History of, the Ju uh, of Judaism Through Its Books. Uh, I know that some of you have met our speaker, Jeffrey Spitzer, uh, and perhaps there are others of you who are thinking, gee, I thought Rabbi Spitzer's first name was Rafi. So just to clear things up, uh, Jeffrey Spitzer is Rafi Spitzer's father. And uh, he, and by that I mean Jeffrey, has an extensive background in Jewish adult education, including online education. He is the lead educator for the organization Conversational Torah. Uh, he's also he is a graduate of Columbia University, where he received his degree summa cum laude in ancient studies, and he received a master of philosophy degree with distinction from uh, with distinction in ancient Judaism from the Jewish Theological Se uh, Seminary. Uh, he has taught classes in rabbinics, liturgy, midrash, among other topics, and he is a contributing editor for one of my favorite websites, MyJewishLearning.com. Uh, the idea that Jeffrey would be presenting the history of the people of the book through its books is something that captured the imagination of all of us on the Adult Ed Committee. And any of you who have looked at the materials that he's prepared for us must also have an intimation of the exciting course that we will be beginning tonight. And so with that, Jeffrey Spitzer, welcome to Congregation Agudat Akim. Thanks so much. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here and pleased to have this opportunity to develop a whole new way of teaching Jewish history. Over the past um, seven years, I've been working very hard on a whole other model called the history of Jewish peoplehood. Um, but um, when Rabbi Spitzer asked me, I call him Rafi, when, whatever, when Rabbi Spitzer um, asked me to do something that I could do in four to six sessions, um, that wouldn't work. Um, so I came up with this different model um, that I figured fit well with the idea of a back to basics course. Um, and hopefully um, some of what you learn here in this, in this part of the, the course will support your learning um, as you do the rest of the uh, learning um, in the back to basics series. So I'm sharing my screen now. Um, and um, what we have here is I'm, I'm going to be, um, you should be able to see me um, and this and I should be able to get your chat. I don't see that though. Um, maybe I'll, okay. I don't, I don't see where I'm supposed to, oh, maybe I can do it this way. Um, Yeah, it's not working that way. But okay, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, if there are, if there are questions, um, I'll pause at regular at regular intervals, um, and you can get a sense of what we're going to what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be doing it. If you have um, the materials that I sent out that that are, were published on Safaria, um, we're going to I'm going to show all of those materials. Although I might show just short shortened parts of that in the, um, on, the, on the screen, um, but it's worthwhile um, next time if you want to have it, you can take notes on it directly. Um, so the question that I wanna start with is, how do you approach Jewish history? What do you do when you wanna teach um, Jewish history? And I already mentioned um, that I developed this whole other approach called the history of Jewish peoplehood, where I only focus on three questions of Jewish history, and I try and look at those three questions as they emerge throughout Jewish um, um, history. Um, and I think you can um, use other models like traditional retellings, like how Mishnah Avot says, oh, Moses received the Torah at Sinai and he passed it on to Joshua and Joshua passed it on to the elders, and the elders um, to the prophets. And you can say, oh, okay, here's our structure. Or you could just talk about the history in terms of who was ruling the Jews at different times, an entirely political history. Um, there are a lot of different ways in which you can do Jewish history. You can come up with Zionist historiography, which really focuses exclusively on how do Jews 
um, make their way back to the land, basically. Um, and when did they leave? And most of the time that they're outside the land, which is the most, which is the bulk of Jewish history, they ignore. Um, but here we're going to try and focus on great books and writing and publishing and how did that um, reflect what was going on in the period of Ju in, in, in each period of Judaism, as well as have an impact on it. Um, I want to show a graphic that I think is really kind of fun. Um, and it's especially fun for me because um, I used to have it in my classroom, and then we used to put it in Rabbi Spitzer's, in, in his bedroom when he was a kid. Um, so I'm looking at it and thinking about his bedroom from when he was a little kid. Um, but it, the reason why he wanted it, it was never clear to me. I actually never really liked the poster. Um, the poster has uh, Sinai up here at the top, okay. and you can understand Jewish history through the places and the, and the documents that were produced um, across time. So here are the Tanaim, who were the people who produced the Mishnah. And then here's the Talmud, and I, the, the Talmud from uh, Eretz Israel, and here's the Talmud from Bavel. Um, why they put Bavel in the West as opposed to the East, I don't know. Um, but, um, and then you've got the Sea of Halakha, and it's like this one seamless mush of stuff. And it doesn't really tell you much about the nature of either Jewish literature um, or Jewish history. What I did like about it was over here in the corner when I was teaching in Boston, um, over here in the corner it says Boston because Boston was on the map. And I wanted my students to recognize that they were also part of this ongoing um, process of seeing Torah. This is a different way of looking at the history of Jewish books. Um, and it's something that you can see on my website. Um, and this tiny URL is a quick way of getting to it. Um, but it's a genre map of, of Jewish literature and specifically of rabbinic literature. And you can see, here's the Bible, or here's the Torah, and here's the prophets. And there are books that share the structure of the Bible, like the Midrash Agadah and commentaries um, on, those, on the Bible are obviously organized around them. There's other Mishnah that are also organized um, around it. Here's the Mishnah, and which is a book that we'll be talking about in the next class, and all the books that follow its structure. Um, and then you can look at um, the the way the Talmud is set up and how the Rif follows that, or the Tour and how the Shulchan Aruch follows that. You can see the kinds of relationships and structures. This is, I think, a little bit more useful than the Sea of Halakha, but it really doesn't give you much in terms of history. Um, and I did create a tool that I think is really useful for you, um, and I strongly encourage you to see it. The link is on the Safari sheet. Um, again, you go to conversationaltorah.com um, and tools slash JH timeline slash JH timeline. It's there, um, and I can send out the link otherwise um, as well. Um, but it's a really useful tool. Here I made a little video of how you can use it. Um, and you can scroll back and forth. You can filter um, different parts of the, of the thing, whether you just want to look at events or people or the most important stuff. You can search the database, which will search the entire database. So Spinoza shows up both under the, the general description of the early modern period. Um, and here you can see, and you can click on the links um, and it keeps on showing you more material or RF Spinoza and you can get a big picture of him. Um, all of these are rights managed, so it's, these, are, they, these are useful tools. Um, and I encourage you to use this um, now and later and whenever else in the context of the courts. Um, and I did something special, I think, um, for, um, for the, why is it going? Um, for the class that you can, why is that there? Um, that's, you can actually see the specific aspects of Jewish history um, by clicking on a particular link. I'll show that to you later. Um, okay, so now we're gonna um, enter into what we're focusing on today, which is Torah as constitution and the Tanakh as an anthology. Um, so the way I'm looking at the Torah as a constitution is that on the one hand, the Torah has this narrative. It talks about from, all the way from creation, going into the land. 
but the Torah, despite the fact that it's overall, overall chronological, um, there are places where its chronological consistency doesn't really work. That there are times where things seem to be um, out of order. The rabbis recognize this um, and um, made this general principle that you can't actually follow the chronological consistency. The great example of that is, were they building the, the tabernacle before the, the, the incident of the golden calf, or did it happen in the middle, which is the way it shows up in the narrative, which doesn't make much sense. And so you can't really necessarily follow just by reading the Torah, figure out what the actual chronology was. But history is basically any kind of representation of the past. Um, and you can do that in all kinds of different ways. And one other thing that I want to focus on is that history has an ideology. That is, when you decide to narrate a history, write a history, do history, um, you've got some kind of mindset involved. And we can look at that in a variety of different examples. Um, the most useful example is actually the Book of Chronicles in the Bible, because the Book of Chronicles unlike anything else in the Bible, we know what its sources are. The Book of Chronicles tell, narrates the entire history of the Jewish people um, from creation all the way until um, the return in the Persian period. And it has a very clear focus on King David and King Solomon, um, which is why the first nine chapters of the book, which cover all the way from Adam to David, are pretty much just genealogies. So it's there, it's narrated, it doesn't represent the past very much. Um, and when we don't have the sources in cases other than the book of Chronicles, Divrei Hayamim, um, how do we actually identify what the history is? That is, what is the ideology behind the, history, behind, uh, the, the document itself when we don't know what it was working with. What sources did it have? How did it manipulate those sources? What sources were unavailable to it and didn't have an impact on it? So it's kind of, it's kind of difficult to actually talk about the Torah in historical terms um, since we don't have explicitly sources, which doesn't mean that we don't think it had sources. We do, but it's kind of hard. Now here, um, I'm gonna go over a brief um, chronology of the time that is covered in the Bible. And we'll just make sure that everybody's on the same page. But if you go to, um, if you go to the Jewish history timeline, on the very far left, there are a bunch of different um, facets by which you can sort through the material. First, you should click reset all filters, and then you can click from Genesis, which is short for from Genesis to Sidur Lev Shalem, that is this course. Um, and it will give you the list of, of items that I'm gonna show, that we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, and as we progress, I'll add more things from the 280 items that are on the timeline um, into that part of the, the, the window. So you can just have a record of those, which you can display in timeline mode, or you can click on a table and it will show you. So our story starts with creation. Um, I don't really have much to say about creation. Um, I don't know that it counts as part of history. But then we go from creation and eventually 10 generations later, we talk about Abraham and his movement to Canaan and the stories of the patriarchs and the matriarchs followed by the descent to Egypt and the exodus from Egypt. And actually, the descent from Egypt is kind of interesting because is that the descent of Egypt to Egypt in the days of Joseph or the descent to Egypt in the days of Abraham, which in this order you wouldn't recognize as being different, but that story repeats, which is a point that we'll come back to. Um, actually repeats again and again. Then there's the entrance to the land, and um, once the, the Jewish people enters into the, into the land of Israel, you have this kind of tribal leadership with different tribes 
um, dividing up the land um, and having leadership probably by the eldest of different tribes who become the princes of those different tribes. Um, ultimately, the tribal leadership model um, descends into a kind of anarchy and King Saul initially and then King David um, move past that anarchy and establish the early monarchy. Um, it doesn't last that long. Um, it lasts through David's son, um, Solomon. And then after Solomon, because of a variety of issues, that, um, that early monarchy um, is divided and you end up with um, a split in the kingdoms of Judah in the south and Israel in the north. Um, and that lasts for quite a while. And the, um, and the kingdom of Israel is clearly the dominant kingdom. It took 10 of the tribes as opposed to the kingdom of Judah, which took, just took the tribal areas of Judah and Benjamin. Um, archaeologically, that also seems to be the case. Um, it's much more advanced. It builds more cities. It engages more in more trade. And Judah is kind of a backwater until um, the northern kingdom of Israel um, is conquered by the Assyrians in 722. Um, and you end up with a lot of refugees from the northern kingdom of Israel moving down into Judah, which causes a variety of interesting um, um, changes with the, after that contest. Um, ultimately, the the um, kingdom of Judah is also conquered, um, this time by the Babylonians. Um, and you have people who are exiled to Babylonia, but after about 70 years, um, Jews start returning first under, uh, under um, the, the Persians with um, Cyrus, who gives permission for it, and, and um, Darius, um, who actually sees it happen, um, where people move back to the land of Israel. Everybody moved back? No, not everybody moves back. Some people move back. Um, and they rebuild um, what's called um, the Second Commonwealth um, and build the Second Temple, which is not as impressive um, as the First Temple and reflects a kind of diminished status and a diminished perception of that period. Um, after a while, another, another um, hundred and some odd years, um, in 330, you have Alexander the Great conquering um, all, of, all of that part of the Mediterranean down to, down to Egypt. Um, it's divided up. During this period, the people who were the leaders of the Jews were priests, descendants of Aaron, um, and they continued to be under the rule of uh, Alexander's uh, successor generals, first um, the Ptolemies who were based in Egypt, then the Seleucids um, who were based in Syria, um, eventually because the Seleucids were having um, difficulty on their eastern border, the uh, Jews in, uh, in, in um, Judea were able to throw off their rule. Um, which was the beginning of the Hasmonean period. And it's in this period, the Hasmonean period, when the final books of the Bible are um, included in the Bible, like the book of Daniel. And that's a brief narrative that covers the chronology, not of the Bible itself, because um, the Bible itself doesn't narrate the Hasmonean period or the Hellenistic period, but the books that are made, in, that make it into the Bible come from this period. Um, okay. Um, oh, what happened? Sorry, I went one too far. Um, so when we look at the, the Torah, um, and now we're going to actually get, did I skip one? I think so. Um, no. Um, when we look at the Torah, we have a traditional perspective of the Torah being given at Sinai. And that is a difficult view for some people to hold on to and a difficult view for some people to, um, 
who reject. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's one that really is, is a compelling um, myth by which I mean the, a story in which we see ourselves and see our culture and see our history, um, that Torah is somehow divine in its origin. Um, I'm not going to address the theological issues. I'm gonna leave that for Rabbi Spitzer to deal with. Um, but I will say that the consensus among the critical biblical scholars is that the Torah does have documents that uh, lie behind it, lie behind it, but we don't actually have direct access to those. We only have a variety of different clues as to where these different documents come from. Um, these were initially found or identified um, in a book, this book here, um, the Prolegomena to the History of Ancient Israel um, by Julius Wellhausen. Um, and he described um, four main documents, which he imagines were documents that were then edited together in different ways. Um, and um, the J source, which represents um, which commonly uses the name of God that they would transliterate with a J, that is um, what we consider the Tetragrammaton, the four, the four letter name of God, um, which they call, which in scholarly circles, they call the Yahwistic source. Um, the E source, which was produced largely in the North a little bit later um, and um, is called the E for Elohist. The D source, which is uh, Deuteronomy and the P source, which is all of this priestly material that gets um, redacted into the earlier material. Um, and then there are um, later scholars, um, including my teacher, Israel Knoll, um, who talks about H, which was a holiness code, which was a supplement to P, um, which wasn't its own document ever, but was kind of added in. And they also refer to R, the redactor. And there are lots of different ways in which people understand the relationships between these different sources um, in the Bible. There isn't any consensus about that. Um, so some people make no claims about the relationship between D versus P, but some have D before P, and some have P before D, um, or even D before J. Others focus on the redactor, and others talk about two different editions of D or a holiness supplement to P. And you end up with a lot of different possible models. Um, and there isn't even agreement about which parts of, which, of, of the Bible, uh, of the Torah, um, necessarily are parts of the different um, documents. So it's, it's, it's messy. Most scholars believe that there is that there is plenty of evidence for this kind of documents, uh, documentary approach, which is called the documentary hypothesis. Um, but again, there isn't consensus about every aspect about uh, how you divide up the Torah this way, or what the order is, or, how, or where, they, where they emerged and where they were edited together. Um, there are even people who um, assume that there was never a one of these like strange complications of how things were put together, but rather um, you have um, an initial source and a source that was added on top of that, and another source that was added on top of that, and another and another material was added on top of that. That's called the supplementary model, um, which some great people, including my um, father-in-law. Um, Rabbi Spitzer's grandfather um, is a strong advocate for. Um, that grandfather, my father-in-law, is Roy Tannenbaum, and he was the one who taught me to think of the Torah as constitution. Um, and I'm going to talk about what that means. Um, I don't actually agree with my father-in-law on the supplementary model, um, but I do believe that he he has a particular focus on how we look at the Torah um, as a political document. And I think it's really very important um, to give him credit because I wouldn't have thought of calling it Torah's constitution without him. Um, and he's written 
um, massively on this topic. Um, Excuse me? Yeah. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. I was just thinking that it's possible that you just used the term supplementary model without defining it. Ah, so that was, there's, there's one source and then something was added on top of it and something was added on top of that and something was added on top of that. As opposed, as opposed to, to, as opposed to you've got these two different sources and you merge them together somehow and then there's this other source over here and you merge that in. It's that his idea, the supplementary model, is that at each point, the document that preceded it was seen as authoritative. But then they added on to that authoritative text, um, that constitution, with additional material, amendments um, to make the constitutional um, metaphor more here, um, adding on new material, adding on a new preface, adding on a new story. Um, but each time they had a complete work before them. And it's not that there's certain things that were only narrated, narrated in J and certain things that were only narrated in E. Um, and then they got put together, but rather the stories are plumped on top of each other. That's what he meant by a supplementary model. And again, I, my focus tonight is not about the different models of biblical criticism, but what I think is the, the, the bigger underlying principle, and that is this idea that the Torah itself is a document which reflects political conflict and political development and evolution. Um, and we can look at the stories without too much concern about, about their sources and recognize that some of these things are happening because we're, we're trying to work out a politics in the context of the Torah. Um, and this brings me to the, the text that I think is actually, I mean, it's based on a passage from the Midrash from Rishi Rabbah, um, but the Ramban expresses it beautifully. The Ramban, um, a medieval um, Spanish scholar, makes his way to the land of Israel um, and writes a variety of different um, books, including a commentary on the Torah. Um, says, Lo davar me'ora There wasn't a single incident that befell the father that didn't befall the children. It is everything that happened to the children happens later on to their, uh, to the parents, happens later on to their children. So you have this, you have this development um, of repeated stories. Um, we look at that and we talk about that as, as a typology, right? This, this story is, becomes a model for what happened later on and it happens again and again. Um, so for instance, think about the Exodus narrative, okay? Um, and I mentioned it earlier, um, Abraham goes down to Egypt for a famine, right? And Pharaoh's whole house suffers. And it uses the language of plagues happening um, there. And Pharaoh expels him. And then he has people who follow um, Abraham out. But ultimately, Abraham leaves with great property. That sound similar to a story that you're familiar with? It should. Because Israel goes down to Egypt for famine, there are plagues, they leave with great property, they're expelled, and then they're followed out. Right? The whole model is exactly there. Right? And the Ramban says, ah, what happened to the father happens to the children. But that was... Um, sorry. Um... So another teacher of mine, Mark Brettler, I actually caught his kid, or one of his kids, um, um, wrote this great book, um, sorry, this great book, um, which is called The Creation of History in Ancient Israel. Um, and it's there where he introduces um, a frame called um, pre-enactment, not reenactment, which is the way you think of in terms of a typology. Oh, what happened with the father happens again with the children. Rather, what happens with the children, 
okay, is retold, pre-enacted about the ancestors. So let's take a look at this one passage, and I want you to, I want you to um, read it to yourselves. This is a passage from 1 Chronicles 5, and again, I told you that all the first nine chapters of 1 Chronicles are all just a genealogy, and it starts with a genealogy, and then it has a little bit of a, a little bit of an aside there. Okay, so just read this to yourselves, the sons of Reuben. Okay, so what's going on in this story? What's going on in this passage? And here, if you, if you have an idea, just unmute yourself and, and share it. What is the concern that the author of Chronicles is trying to explain? Who gets the birthright? Yeah, who gets the birthright? And so he starts with Reuben, and Reuben should have had the birthright because he was the firstborn. But he doesn't get the birthright. Now, how do you know that Reuben doesn't get the birthright? I'll tell you straight off, it never says that he doesn't get the birthright. He's shamed, he's cursed, but um, in, and in Genesis 35, it talks about how he slept with the concubine Bilhah, and in Genesis 49, it says that he defiled his father's bed, but it doesn't say that he was ever disinherited. It doesn't ever say that he was not the didn't get the birthright how do you know he didn't get the birthright tribe of reuben isn't powerful the tribe of reuben isn't powerful and more importantly the tribe of reuben only gets one portion in the land whereas the tribe of yosef gets two portions there's a tribal area for the tribe of ephraim the half tribe of Ephraim, and there's a tribal area for the half tribe of Menashe. The tri tribal area of for Ephraim is actually the bulk of what we consider the kingdom, kingdom of Israel. It's by far the largest tribal area, and Ephraim is the largest. Menashe is across the Jordan, but that, that, that means Joseph got two portions. And if you look in Deuteronomy, Right, it says, "Oh, the 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 eldest the eldest gets the birthright, and he gets two portions. Reuben doesn't get the first the doesn't get two portions, so therefore Reuben must not be the firstborn." But what they're doing is they're looking at Reuben the tribe and saying, "Oh, Reuben the tribe, we have to explain why does he only have one one tribal area? Why does Yosef have two? And the answer is pre-enactment. They're looking at the eponymous ancestors and saying, oh, this story of Reuven defiling his father's bed, that's why he lost his birthright. So I don't think that Chronicles is wrong. I think that Reuven did lose his birthright, but I would put it the other way. That is, Reuven wasn't a powerful tribe. It had one, it had one tribal area actually outside the land of Israel, and Yosef got two. And so therefore, they came up with a story to explain why is it that the firstborn isn't getting the oh. firstborn birthright? And why is it that Joseph, who is the firstborn of the other wife, gets it? But then he points out yet another thing, besides for Reuben and Joseph. He talks about Judah and how Judah becomes more powerful than his brothers, even though Yosef, even though the, the two tribes of, uh, for Yosef have more land, right? 
And again, I think this is an example of pre-enactment. The stories that talk about Judah as superseding Reuven, and we'll talk about them in a second, right? Those are stories that are there to reflect the larger dynamics of what happens later on. So that the Torah is telling stories that explain what happens later on, pre-enactment. But isn't this also a piece where it's a reenactment of where uh, Abraham and his two sons and the older son does not get the birthright and the same thing with uh, Jacob and, and Esau? Excellent. We're, I was just going to think about, think about models where primogenitor, that is the, the authority of the, of the firstborn, is undercut again and again, right? So you talked about, I mean, there's Isaac replaces the elder Ishmael. We've got Jacob, who replaces um, Esau, who also specifically despises his inheritance, right? Elders, the, the elder not only loses his, loses his portion, but doesn't even really appreciate it in the first place. Um, or the story that we just talked about, Reuven tries to sleep with, or sleeps with Bilha and he loses his firstborn. Joseph, who gets the birthright with two tribal portions. Reuven, in the story about Joseph, right? Reuven is the one, and, and now, now beyond the issue of primogenitor and, and, and right, Reuven plans to come back for Yosef, right? Um, when Joseph is, when, when um, they're trying to get rid of, of their brother, right? But Judah su suggests to sell him. Reuven's plan fails, Judah's plan succeeds, right? Or again, when they have to go back to the land because they need more grain, Reuven tries to come um, and fails to convince Jacob to return to Egypt and says, you can kill my sons um, if I don't succeed at bringing back, at bringing back um, um, if, I, if I don't take care of Benjamin. Um, but Judah is the one who successfully convinces Jacob and says, I personally am going to take responsibility, right? So again, there's the story, Reuven, the first, firstborn, it's gone, but um, Judah takes over. And yet again, when Benjamin is put into jeopardy, it's Judah who's the one who stands forward and, um, and takes care of Benjamin. So what we've got there is um, a series of different kinds of conflicts, all of which are about the, the role of primogenitor. Um, that is, do we say that the firstborn should have power and should have authority? No. We reject it consciously again and again and again. Um, and that's because primogenitor, which was probably the model of the great leader that existed in the context of the tribes, is rejected. And what is it replaced with? Monarchy. And monarchy, at least from the perspective of the J source, means Judah. So, so Ruve, can so I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. So when you talk about the the tribal period and the period of primogenitor, can you give it like an approximate like time period that you're because the it's biblical history. So right. if, if the stories here are rejecting the concept of rule of the firstborn, right? Which is the, the concept of primogenitor, the stories are rejecting that. So the stories were written after the fact. The stories were written maybe in the time of the monarchy or maybe even later, but they're, but they're, but they're rejecting a previous form of, 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 of political, the previous political model. When, what year did that model end approximately? So the, the model that it, where they talk about tribes ends with the emergence of Saul and then with David and that's around 1050 before the Common Era to 1000 with, with, with David um, before the Common Era. So prior to that, you had tribes. It was anarchic, and the tribal leaders were largely the firstborns of the different, of the firstborns, and, and usually the firstborns of the firstborn. Um, so within an individual family, there was, a, there was a family of the firstborns, and the firstborn of the firstborn, that was the person who was the head of the tribe. And that's being rejected. That, that didn't function. And instead, um, 
they focus on monarchy. Um, now, it gets kind of complicated when we're dealing with um, the story of Saul, um, because Saul is, is, doesn't fit into this model. But the, the, the stories that talk about this largely are from the J source, and they're talking about Judah. Um, but we see ways in which, for instance, um, um, Saul is of what tribe, anyone know? Okay. Benjamin? Uh, yeah, so Saul's, a, Saul's, a, Saul's um, of, of Benjamin, but he's in um, Ephraim, and that's the larger area. And that, that, that the larger area of the, of the kingdom of Israel is in this tribe of Ephraim. And you can see here um, that, that famous story where Jacob puts his hands, and even though Menashe is the eldest, right, he crosses his hand and puts his hand over Ephraim. Right, because Ephraim becomes the the powerful one, not Menashe, um, and um, the northern kingdom is dominated by that the tribal area of Ephraim. Um, okay, this, the the rejection of primogenitor is not is not absolute. You should know that there there were people who had voices um, that disagreed. Um, and let's take a look at this very interesting and kind of strange law that emerges, that shows up um, in the Deuteronomic source, which is much later. If a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him sons, but the firstborn is the son of the unloved one. When he wills his property to his sons, he may not treat as firstborn the son of the loved one in disregard of the son of the unloved one who is older. Instead, he must accept the firstborn, the son of the unloved one, and allot to him a double portion of all he possesses. Since he is the first fruit of his vigor, the birthright is his due. Well, if I'm right about what I said earlier, then this passage is saying what? What does it say about Ruvain and Yosef? That it was done incorrectly. Yes. They Deuteronomy is saying, yeah, right? Deuteronomy is saying Yosef should not get the double portion. Right. Ruvain should get the double portion. He's the, it doesn't matter if he's the eldest of the unloved, of the unloved wife, right? He's, he's, he's the eldest. He should get it. So, I don't know that Deuteronomy is here making a claim about um, returning to primogenitor. In fact, I think he's not. I think it's actually talking about property law on the ground. But looking at the stories that already exist in front of him and, and what he knows about the way it, it played out, he's going to reject this. He's going to reject that claim it because he doesn't want people to think, well, practically, you should um, decide the law however you want. And it's a contrary voice. Um, but again, I, I'm making my guess at that. It could be, it could be that indeed it is a political claim. I just don't know how we're supposed to, how we're supposed to play that out um, in the time when Deuteronomy was written. So I assume that it's actually talking about the actual distrib uh, distribution of property inside families um, and doesn't want people to make the, take the political stories as if they are a legal authority for your own family. If you reject the firstborn, who then becomes um, empowered? Well, the Torah gives us one model, um, and that is that the, if the firstborns are the people who have um, political and ritual authority, um, we can replace them with Levites. And that's at a whole other area. We've got this two, uh, we've got the ritual authority and we've got the political authority. And in some ways, firstborns were seen as having authority in both areas. When the king takes the political authority, the Levites become the people who are authoritative in the ritual area. So now I want to take a look at a particular text case, 
Um, and this is um, something that I lifted from the Torah.com. That is T H E T O R A H.com, an unbelievably useful um, website. And they looked at a variety of different possible ways of reading the Korach story um, and looking at it from a, a documentary perspective. So I've taken what they call what's the peace source um, and put it in red flush left. And the blue is the J source and it's, and it's blue and flush right. Um, anything that's redact, the redactor is in black or things that look like they're later um, are, um, are in Can black. Can you give us the approximate dates of the red source and the blue source? Yeah, so the, so the P is very complicated. The J source is probably, probably emerges around 850 CE and P um, went through probably a couple of different um, um, editions and different people debate whether it's actually written in the Babylonian exile that is around sometime um, in the sixth century BCE or written a little bit before the Babylonian exile or after. And my guess is it's both before and after and probably not during the exile um, um, in Babylonia. So if you take a look at the story, right? And you can actually read the, the story as divided um, consistently, right? Korach, the son of Itzar, son of Kahat, took, uh, uh, son of Kahat, son of Levi, took two, 250 Israelites, chieftains of the community, and chosen in, chosen in the assembly, men of repute, and they gathered against Moses and Aaron, and they said, you've gone too far. All the people, all the people are holy. What are you doing raising yourself up above God's congregation. And then you have this story of this test with the incense. Um, and then later on, you've got a different one. It's not, it, the, the first complaint is there shouldn't be people who are above the congregation. It's kind of a, um, an egalitarian model. Everybody's equal. But then they say, oh no, it's really about the Levites. You shouldn't make the Aaronites and the descendants of Aaron better than the rest of the Levites. This leads um, my teacher Israel Knoll to read the story as not about two different rebellions. One we're going to look at, we haven't looked at the, the Reuben story first, but there's a rebellion um, against, um, against the leadership at all by the 250 Israelites. You've got a leader, you've got a rebellion um, against uh, by the by the descendants of Ruvain, which is this claim of the Reubenites against perhaps the Levites or whoops or against the Judahites. Sorry, um, and then you've got this um, rebellion of Levites against the people who put the authority with with Aaron. You read the J source, right? You have Datan Abiram the sons of Eliab, et cetera, got up before Moses, and Moses and Moses sent for Tatan and Aviram. There's kind of a gap there. It's not exactly sure why I mean, whether that's the best way of of dividing it. And they say, we're not gonna come. You didn't bring us to a land of milk and honey. It's a totally different kind of complaint. Right? It's nothing about who's in charge. It's that you didn't do what you're supposed to do. Right, it's a different, it's a different kind of a rebellion and a different kind of complaint. Um, now, this this line fifteen, um, I think it's J. I kept it in red because that's what Torah.com did, but I'm pretty sure that it's J, right? And Moses is incredibly ag um, aggrieved about this, and he says, "Pay no regard to their oblation." That doesn't really make too much sense because they haven't made any kind of offering, but it's not clear. But then he makes a claim: "I've not taken the ass of any one of them, nor have I wronged any of them." And then you see. The complaint about Korach and this story about the the story about the fire pan and all of that that's P. That's the, that's this other story about Korach and against the Aaronites. And then it continues, and God says, "Speak to the community and say, withdraw from about the abode of Korach." And then line twenty seven. So they withdrew from about uh, from about the abode of Korach, 
and a fire went forth from God and consumed the 250 men offering the incense, which again, Knoll would read differently. These words, that's not enough, Iram, don't show up in the Septuagint. And so the Bible, biblical critical scholars assume that they are um, a later editing into the text of the Torah. Um, because the earliest, the earliest version that we have of the Torah is actually the Greek translation, the Septuagint. Um, and so if you look in it, it's, it's missing. You have to ask yourself, so what happened to our version of the text? On the other hand, you've got the J version. And again, you've got the story about Datan and Aviram, and um, they go down to, they get swallowed up by the land, by the earth. So you've got different punishments, different complaints, different people who are acting, um, and the two stories get merged together. And that's how they, that's how they, uh, that's how this kind of, this functions. And you can look at this story and you say, ah, wow, at different periods, there were different kinds of complaints and different kinds of arguments about who should be leading Israel. Is it the Aaronites over the other Levites? Is it the Levites over the rest of the people? Who's supposed to be ruling? Um, so you're suggesting that these stories are written by political actors in different time periods who are, tr who are using this trope of rebelling against, the, against Moses to, uh, to make a political point, sort of like satire or whatever, for their own time period. Well, so would, they're, they're it... setting the, the, the characters in the past, but it's really about what's happening in their present. Yes, but I wouldn't say that, I mean, look, once they're writing the stories and they've got the characters of Moshe and Aaron and they know who they are, the later, the later sources aren't just making up from whole cloth. They are trying to revise the story to reflect the conflicts that exist, in, that exist um, in their periods. Um, and so they revise them, they edit them. That's actually support for um, my father-in-law's um, reading that it's supplementary. Um, it could be that you've got different, these were very just different narratives um, and, the exist, and the use of different kinds of vocabulary um, between these uh, two different, the red parts and the blue parts suggests that these were different, different rebellion stories that were in circulation in different places, um, which then got merged together. Um, and I'll give you one other quick example. Okay, everybody um, let's take a look at this. What is this picture? It's the golden calf. It's the golden calf. Now take a look at the picture again and tell me what, what, what's strange about this picture if it's a picture of the golden calf. There's a crown. Yeah, who's the guy with the crown? The guy with the crown. And that's kind of weird. Yeah, um, yeah. But you think it, right, it makes sense that this is Aaron building the golden calf um, from Exodus 32. Um, but it's kind of it's kind of strange. But if we actually take a look, we realize actually that we only were looking at part of the story, because this is actually what the picture is. Now what's oh. this picture of? Okay, so this one you may not know, um, but in one king in one kings thirteen and fourteen, they talk about King Jeroboam, who set up the temples in Beit El and in Dan. Um, which are, Beit El is just to the north of the tribal area, or the, the kingdom of Judah, and at the very south end of the northern kingdom of Israel, and Don is the very north end. So he built a temple at the very south end, at the very north end, to protect his, 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 his very large kingdom, compared to Judah, which is a very small kingdom, um, and put a golden calf in each one. Now, why he did it, I'm not going to talk about, because I think it's a, it's a, whole, it's a whole other... Um, issue and it's and there are some great books that I'll mention later um, that I think are, are really worthwhile to look at um, but he did this two calves and he said Ela Elohecha Yisrael these are the gods who took you out Asher Elucha Mieret Yisraim who plural took you out of the land of Egypt that 
is exactly the same phrase that Aaron says when he's only working with one calf, and it should have been, right, you know, Ze Elohecha, Yisrael, Asher Helcha, Meretz Mitzrayim. It should have been in singular, but he doesn't speak in, in singular, he speaks in plural. Why? Pre-enactment. The story of Jeroboam, uh, King Yeroboam, and his golden calves becomes the story of Aaron and the golden calf. And to make that very clear, they use the same language, including the plural about the golden calves um, in that version. Really worthwhile studying more, more in depth um, and figuring out politically what is this actually saying and who is it, who's in favor and why did they decide to miss Aaron in this story? Why do they disrespect Aaron by making him the person? Why does he represent um, Yarovam? Um, but that, that um, association of Yaravam and Aaron is pretty inescapable, um, especially when you see that Yaravam's um, children are named Nadav and Aviyah, um, as opposed to um, Aaron's children, Nadav and Avihu. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it's a pretty clear case, although what, what is the case against Aaron? Not, not so obvious. So, uh, before you go on, uh, yeah. there's a question that came in in the text chat. Um, assuming that there were a variety of political ideas behind the events of the Torah, why was there a need felt to have it written down? Who was supposed to read it? Ah, so, um, hmm, I thought I had that word, that one up there, but I, I guess I must have skipped that page. I knew it skipped the page. Um, is, oh no, it's coming up. Um, the word for Bible is not Tanakh. That's our, our word that we use for it. But the word for Bible is actually Mikra. It means that which is read, or better, that which is recited. And um, the Bible is a text that was recited. People had regular festivals on full moons, um, and this was cult literature. Um, my father-in-law believes that it was cult literature so much so that that people, you know, heard these stories again and again and again, and that's why he imagined a supplementary model, because how could you get rid of things that everybody knows already? So there must have been an authoritative version, and you kept on adding on to it, and adding on is a different thing than getting rid of stuff or, or changing it around. Um, so um, I think that that's, that, that, people wrote these kinds of documents precisely because they saw it as constitutional. Because by making, by having the authoritative version of the story of the Jews as they lived in the desert or as they lived before they got down to Egypt, this is, these are the stories that, that it's, it's the political narrative of the day. Um, and did everybody read it that way? I'm not sure. Um, I think that they, there was a, I, I think you, you make a big mistake when you, when you underestimate the capability of, of people in the ancient world to believe stuff. Um, I think they, they believed all kinds of stuff. And I think that um, they heard a story and they said, oh, now I get it. Um, right. How could, and, and then Jeroboam becomes this incredible um, bad guy who all of the other kings and kings of the north are bad because they're like Jeroboam and and how could he have chosen a golden calf after all doesn't he know that Aaron did this that, that, that that's that's our sin that caused us that caused us so much sorrow in the in, in the desert and even though that story is, um, is written about Jeroboam you know a couple a hundred years later the golden calf story is 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 the, is the dominant story. And people are thinking about it just like everybody looked at that part of the image and said, oh, it's the golden calf because that's what we recognize. And then everybody else is seen as, as being dismissed because of that. Um, so here is basically what we suggested that the Torah is a composite document. Um, and there are narratives and laws, both of which are seen um, as authoritative, authoritative, and they reflect the different power interests of different groups. 
including firstborns and Levites and descendants of Aaron and kings and, and, and tribal leaders and um, king-like Aaronite high priests that have emerged in the, in the Persian period, but all of those different groups who are um, expressing their authority um, in the context of the Torah. Now, I want to make a specific note about reading the Torah since you're all reading the Torah um, on a regular uh, basis and living a life of Torah, right? I think it's really important to be able to make this kind of political reading. And I think it's, um, um, I think that not everything in the Torah is subject to this kind of political reading and you're not gonna, and you're not gonna be able to figure it out anyway because we just don't know enough of the history um, or we don't, there isn't enough agreement to be able to figure out how to do that political reading, so don't go overboard. The crucial part is that political readings of the Torah don't provide much of an opportunity for your own personal growth or your or communal guidance. And for that, I encourage you to look to um, your rabbi um, for that insight and for the guidance. And that's what your rabbi's for. And um, that's a theme that we'll talk about where how he got where he is um, um, through the other books that we're going to be studying over the course of this um, over the course of this class. Um, here are a bunch of books that I think are really wonderful. Um, and um, if you're if if I piqued your interest, it's worthwhile reading Who Wrote the Bible by Richard Elliott Friedman, which was written a long time ago already, but is still a really good book on this topic. Um, the Divine Symphony Symphony by Israel Kandol. Um, again, one of my favorites, this uh, this book here. Um, um, creation of um, History in Ancient Israel, which I referred to, and another book by another teacher of mine, um, Avigdor Shinan, I never studied with Yair Zakovich, called From Gods to God, widely available um, and really quite good. And again, that website, Torah.com. So now I've got less than half an hour to do with, deal with um, Tanakh's anthology. It's an easier topic, though. The Torah is a constitutional kind of document, a document that's really um, that's, that's powerful and people look at it. Hang, hang um, on a second. Uh, before you jump into the next topic, yeah, it's possible that there might be people who have questions about the previous topic. If people want to put them up on, on the chat or, or unmute and ask, I can't see everybody, so I can't call on anyone. Gary, did you have a question? Would you like to pose your question? Josh, were you speaking to me? Uh, yes, Gary, you posted a question into the chat. I didn't know if you wanted to. Oh, it was already. No, 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 that one I already responded. Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay, so let's let, let, let's 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 move on. Um, and the Tanakh is a diverse book. And think of you know think of the um, the image of the um, Norton Anthology, right? When you when you look at the Norton Anthology, there are so many different um, kinds of documents in that book. Um, there, sorry, that's the wrong page. I want to go to this one. There are lots of genres. Um, we have um, narratives, and we have um, um, stories, and we have farces and um, like the story of Bilham or the uh, Bilham and the Donkey or the Book of Esther. Um, we've got genealogies, we've got poetry, um, we've got travel itineraries, um, we've got short stories like the Book of Ruth um, or the Joseph Cycle, we've got poetry like um, ha Parshat Ha'azinu or the Song of the Sea or the um, or the Book of Psalms. Um, we've got books that present themselves as history. We've got books that are just kind of wisdom books like Proverbs or um, Ecclesiastes. We've got satires um, like the story of Eglon in Judges. Um, I think that there's lots of different genres like you found in your Norton Anthology when you were taking a, you know, a course on American literature. And all of that is in the Bible. So is it a book or is it books? Right, and we call the word Bible, and it's from the it's from the Latin biblia, 
um, which is the book uh, or a book, um, but the, the same word biblia, biblia um, in Greek is books, plural. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, you know, what makes it a book? Is it a single author? Well, clearly not. Is it a single, all right, but we've got this book and we call it a book, which is kind of ironic since we, um, we actually yes. didn't actually have books back then, um, or, right, we, in fact, we never had a single scroll of this. We have this book, um, but um, scrolls were the Jewish way of, of doing it. Codices come out from, from Christians, but it doesn't have any of these things. It doesn't have a single plot or a single um, point of view. So Bible, reading it as a book, is not a descriptive term, it's a prescriptive term. That is, you're supposed to take a look at this thing and see it as a book, a book that we should be looking at and thinking of, um, not in terms of a diverse set of books, but a book. That said, and that is a function of the, that the rabbis decided to include some stuff in the book and other things were left out. We're going to talk about that next week in terms of what made it in and what didn't make it in. Um, and part of it is about our tradition because we've, we've received this and we've been seeing ourselves as, um, well, largely by Islam, we were called Al-Al-Kitab, the, the, the people of the book. So we think of it as a book. Um, but part of traditionality is actually um, a very interesting thing of pseudepigraphy. That is, we write not in our own name because it has more authority. So for, and, and the biggest example of this in the Bible as a whole is, um, are the, the authors that we refer to or scholars refer to as second and third Isaiah. That is chapters 40 through the end of the book um, are called second and third Isaiah, two different um, authors who adopt some aspects of the style of Isaiah, but got themselves tacked on because they didn't want to say they were some, doing something new. It was part of their own traditionality to, to submerge their own identity and to say, we're part of Isaiah. Um, and, okay, I'm just going to skip those uh, points. Um, I want to just point out that the Bible itself then creates a lot of contradictions. Um, not just with these different genres, but with different approaches. And we have to look at how these contradictions play out. So if you can, just take out a piece of paper or in your head, um, recite either with a mnemonic or just the, 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 the plagues as well as you can in the order, uh, in, their, in their order. You don't have to take out wine, uh, you know, a wine cup and, and, and do anything with that while you're doing so. Okay, so the plagues, right? This is our normal list of, of, of plagues um, with a, a slight difference. Most people don't think of this as arov as flies, um, but it's actually a machloket tanaim. It's a, 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 a disagreement among early scholars, uh, sages of, of the, the rabbis, whether it's swarms of wild beasts or swarms of flies. Um, flies makes a lot of sense if it's followed by sick cattle, but um, it's not clear. Um, Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Nehemia disagree. Um, but these are, these are the, 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 the 10 plagues that you're familiar with. But if you take a look at, for instance, Psalm 78, right? It also tells you about the plagues. And here, it doesn't look exactly the same. What do we have here that's not in our, in our list or what's missing? We don't, we don't talk about a plague of caterpillars, right? We don't talk about um, a plague of frost. We don't talk about um, a plague of, of um, lightning bolts, but Psalm 78 does. So how do you explain this? How do you explain that? Well, if you imagine that the plagues are historical, right? You have to ask yourself, well, which one comes first? Which one, right? Psalm 105 has darkness is the first plague. Which set of plagues are 
do we end up having? Um, and there are a lot of different ways you could deal with this, um, but I want to present a different possibility. One is that in a poetic context, like in the book of Psalms, right, in poetry, the order in which you present something is really powerful. And changing it up, changing it up from a, an expected order would cause confusion, disorientation, kind of like you would experience in the case of plagues. So maybe you could just make a literary uh, uh, explanation, or maybe they're dealing with different sources. Do we harmonize these differences, or do we just allow the different, the different approaches to exist? Well, the latter is clearly what happened. Nobody went into, the Psalm, into Psalm 78 and hyper-edited it so that it would agree with Exodus. It was allowed to state a very different way of looking at the plagues. Or another one, were we good in the land, um, in, in the desert? Jeremiah here talks about how God loves us and, and, and we loved God and, and um, the devotion of your youth and how you followed God in, in the, how we followed God in the wilderness, that we were good. And Psalm 78, no, we were stubborn and rebellious. We were stubborn and rebellious, right? Basic issues of theology. How do we see this, right? Now, again, you could ask one question, with you know, first level question, well, what's the evidence? Were we good or were we bad? And we could look at the books of Exodus or Leviticus and Numbers and try and figure out were we good or were we bad and preponderance of evidence and stuff like that. But the real issue is not what's the evidence say, given the fact that the evidence is probably mixed, um, why do each of these passages present the evidence as if the evidence is not mixed? Right? What's the point behind giving these different voices? Um, or do uh, something, sometimes contradictions that look like they're contradictions aren't really contradictions. So in this case, right, Exodus, again, basic theological question, do children suffer for their parents' sins? Do children suffer for their parents' sins? And Exodus says, yes, God visits the iniquity of the parents on the children and the children's children on the, on the third and fourth generations. But here's this verse from Jeremiah. It says, everyone shall die for his own sins. Whoever eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be blunted. But here you actually have to recognize that Jeremiah, that this verse is not actually standing on its own. Rather, Jeremiah is making a larger claim, and this is not about the present or the way God functions now, but rather a time is coming when there will be a new covenant. And in those days, they, show, they won't say that parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are blended, but everyone shall die for his own sins. That's the verse that we saw. That is, what's being described in Jeremiah is a messianic vision. But what is he doing? He's not contradicting the previous material. He's responding to it. He's looking at this frame that exists all over the Torah that repeats again and again and again that God is going to punish the children for the, for the sins of the parents and saying, that's not the way it should be. That's not the way it's going to be. There will come a time when God will create a new covenant and, that's, and things will change. And again, Jeremiah was authoritative. Did they go and cut out stuff earlier on and say, oh no, Jeremiah said that, this is, that, that, that people shouldn't be doing this, so we should re-edit the Torah? Or they didn't say, Jeremiah, how can you say this? You disagree with the Torah. They didn't cut that out of Jeremiah either. Both voices exist in Tanakh. Um, here's a huge one. In the book of Nehemiah, they build a wall and they celebrate the building of the wall around Jerusalem. And then they open up the Torah and read it in public. And the passage that they just happen to open up to is the passage that says, no Ammonites or Moabites may enter the, the congregation of God. And then a little bit later, Nehemiah talks about um, how he sees lots of people who had intermarried with Ashdodites and Ammonites and Moabite women, and he argues with them, and he curses them, 
and he flogs them and he tears out their hair and he says, you've got to divorce those people. You've got to kick off those children. That's a really powerful statement about how do you deal with the experience of being with foreigners. And at the same time, you've got the Book of Ruth. Um, and the Book of Ruth is probably also written in the Persian period, after Nehemiah, but also in the Persian period. And it talks about, again, kind of like as, as a piece of historical fiction, but it's a story of a leader of Judah who goes and marries a Moabite and, um, and all right, who, uh, or his children marry Moabites. Um, and she comes back to the land of Israel and she marries um, um, this guy Boaz and she has a child. And from Ruth is born the, through the through uh, uh, her her descendants through to David, which is pretty much a, a way of saying, oh look, Ruth, ancestor of David, wow. Had Ruth not married Boaz, then we wouldn't have King David. And in this period, they would have said, and who cares about King David? It's it's the, the descendant of David, the Messiah, who's supposed to be coming. That is by marrying the Moabites, we ended up. We'll, we will get the, we will end up getting the Messiah. So Ruth is clearly written for an audience that thinks that it's a good idea to intermarry, or at least intermarry the right person. And Nehemiah is saying, no, when we're, in, when we're faced with people who are different, we should build up our walls. These are very different voices. The Bible didn't choose to include Ruth and exclude Nehemiah. And the Bible didn't choose to include Nehemiah and exclude Ruth. They're all there. Sometimes people include conflicts on basic theology right inside a text. I'm going to skip this one, but it's worthwhile. Take, take a look at 1 Samuel 15 and try and figure out, does God regret or God, does God not regret? And there are other diverse voices um, in the Bible, and again, worthwhile looking at these different diverse voices, whether it's Moses who serves as, um, as the leader who redeems us from tyranny, and David who redeems us from anarchy, right? These are diverse voices, right? They don't rewrite David or rewrite Moses um, necessarily to fit everything. And this is, again, I think perhaps, you know, a very different perspective than what I was talking about in terms of looking at things constitutionally. But the model of a leader who redeems you from tyranny is very different than the one who redeems you from anarchy. And so it's not surprising that after David, you get a Solomon who perhaps becomes more tyrannical um, in certain ways. Or the book of Kohelet. How the heck did Kohelet get into the Bible? Well, it doesn't fit with anything, right? It, things that it, right? It doesn't believe that, Kohel doesn't believe that things change, that everything stays the same, right? If that's the case, then how can you have tshuva? If that's the case, then how can you change, how can you really make any kinds of choices? And in terms of its epistemology, it's also entirely different. Everywhere else in the Bible, it's about authority comes from tradition, authority comes from God, authority comes from revelation. And Kohelet says, oh, no, it's all about what I see, and I've looked around, and this is what I've observed. It's, it's so different than everything else in the Bible, but it didn't get cut out. It, getting, it, get, it got included. Or the attitudes toward women, Song of Songs, which has a really positive attitude in most ways, um, as opposed to Proverbs, which, despite the fact that it also has, that it has Asia style, has a lot of really nasty stuff about Women. These different voices are all included. Um, so I think when you're looking at the Bible as an anthology with lots of different voices, you have to you have to think about what does it mean to conserve the voices of dissent. And those who put the Bible together were protecting those voices of dissent. Um, I like to think of them as, as this is an ongoing machlokot, l'shem shamayim, ongoing disagreements for the sake of heaven. 
And here I just want to refer to um, the former chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, um, Chaim David Halevi, who referred to one of the cases that we were talking about earlier, um, Nehemiah and Ezra versus Ruth. And he asks, why are these, why didn't Nehemiah, or later on Ezra, just convert these people who had, you know, who had, who had intermarried? Right? Why didn't he do that? Could have done that. Didn't do that. And why did Naomi think that it was acceptable to accept Ruth as a convert? Which, whole other issue, whether that's actually conversion, but it doesn't matter for Chaim David Levy. Why can Naomi accept Ruth as a convert? Isn't Naomi, isn't, isn't Ruth converting for the sake of her love for Naomi? Isn't that a problematic motivation for, for conversion from, from, from a traditional perspective? Not an issue now, but it's like, it was from a traditional perspective, that's, 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 a, that's a problem. And the fact of the matter is that both Ruth and um, Ezra and Nehemiah were put in the Bible, and they were there because he, won, he said later rabbis should be able to look at either model and decide things as they see them. So the Bible exists as an anthology, preserving these voices of dissent, preserving these arguments, because we need those different kinds of voices at different times. Um, I think that um, we have to think about which different voices are part of these ongoing disputes, and that the dispute is sacred. And I think that we have to ask ourselves, how do we end up responding to these different voices? Do we celebrate the different voices? Do we choose between the different voices? Do we harmonize and pretend that there's no dissent at all? Do we try to have what the rabbis call a listening heart so that we, so we gather in all the different voices? These are, these are really difficult challenges about how are we going to react to the Bible. When, I was, when we were living in Greensboro, there was a member of our congregation who um, wanted to suppress the traditional Haftorah for Parshat Ben Midbar, um, which is um, from Hosea, which is a very difficult passage. Or there are lots of communities in, 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 in the Harlow Moxer, they talk about, and I don't remember whether it's also in Moxer Lake Shalem, they give an alternative Torah reading at Yom Kippur at Mincha um, um, because it's easier to read Parshat Kedoshim than to read about prohibited sexual relationships. Are we suppressing those parts of the, of, of, of the Bible's anthology? Should we preserve those voices? And what's the purpose? When do we, when do, we do this? And I, 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 would, I would take a meta message there and ask ourselves, this is how we're responding, this is how we're responding to the Bible, right? How do we respond to those voices that exist within our own community? Do we foster or protect different voices? Do we dissent from them? Do we harmonize them and say, oh, I don't disagree with anybody? Do we try to have a listening heart? How do we relate to those voices that exist within our community? And I think these are really important. Um, so the metaphor that, I, anthology is, is one that I think is a really useful metaphor. Um, but I want to go back to the title of the book that I mentioned earlier um, by Israel Canole, The Divine Symphony, um, The Bible's Many Voices. And um, I think that the, that the musical metaphor is really powerful. And I, though I like to sing, don't consider myself musically educated at all. Um, but um, I think that there's a lot that we can use and see um, in this idea of Torah as a divine symphony. There are refrains, there are voices that we could think of as discordant, but we might think of as harmonies. There are different motifs that, that run through the Bible. There are sometimes discordant notes. I can't read Kohelet without, without hearing it as a discordant note. Um, 
there are different kinds of instrumentation, right? The Bible actually refers to different kinds of instrumentation in the book of Psalms, but, but when you hear a passage that's read first as prose and then as poetry, right? That's akin to instrumentation or arrangement. Well, we saw how different, different stories can get arranged and rearranged. I think this idea of not just anthology, but symphony is one that's really valuable to us. And ultimately, I think we have to ask our questions. I, just, I tried to make a distinction between Torah is constitutional and Tanakh is symphonic. But I think, although much easier to see the ways in which Torah is constitutional, the Torah is also part of that larger symphony. Right? We don't, we don't just have the Torah. We have an entire Bible. And the people who canonized our Bible and gave it to us, and the communities and, and Jewish sages who produced the literature were willing to create a symphony for us to listen to, which is perhaps why we chant it and to think of it as music. There's this one school um, called Beit Rabban in New York, and they've got a very interesting aspect of their pedagogy. From kindergarten up at Beit Rabban, a student never, ever hears the Torah read. Torah is always chanted in whatever context. Um, and I think that if you always think of Torah as a song and you think of it as, a, it, it changes your attitude towards what this book is. And you're more likely to think about Torah as having harmonies and that you're part of a choir, um, a choir that stretches way back in time and hopefully a choir that continues forward um, in time as well. And with that, I've pretty much concluded this, um, this image of Torah's anthology, but even better, or Tanah as a symphony. And I think that um, this sets us up well for moving forward into what books didn't make it. And is there a reason why they didn't make it? And what book became the book, which wasn't really a book, but an oral book, um, and how that became the second book of, Jew, of the Jewish canon, and that is the Mishnah. So if there are more questions at this point um, or comments, I'd be happy to hear them. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see your faces. Um, and please ask or respond. Are there any final questions? If not, thanks very much, uh, Jeffrey. That was a wonderful introduction. Uh, we we'll look forward to hearing more of this next week. Uh, I hope all of you will take a few minutes each week, take a look at the uh, various programs that we have under the heading of Back to the Basics. Uh, and come back and hear more of this uh, when we gather again next week. Rabbi, do you have anything further to say? Well, no, I just thank everybody, and uh, I hope you join us again this Sunday at uh, 1030 for uh, an opportunity to hear from Women of the Wall um, as part of a separate series that we're doing on uh, religion and state in Israel through the Masoreti movement um, and uh, a specific focus on the, the Kotel as a case study in democracy uh, that, uh, that is this coming Sunday, the 6th of December at 10.30. Um, and then uh, next Wednesday night, the second installment of Steve Schmidt's class on giving a Dvar Torah, which if you, uh, if you missed the first class, you can find it uh, on our website uh, under the Back to the Basics tab in the, um, in the 
uh, on the adult education page. I, uh, I skimmed through it uh, earlier this afternoon and was very, very impressed by the thorough uh, introduction that Steve gave the topic. Uh, and we'd love to uh, hear voices of the congregation teaching Torah on Shabbat. So please do uh, follow up. And, and then if you want to give a Dvar Torah, let, let me know. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as Gary said, next week, we're uh, next Thursday night. We're very excited to uh, have Jeff Spitzer back for um, part two and learning about the, the Mishnah. Um, if you do think of questions uh, that you have left lingering from this course, uh, like from this session, uh, feel free to send them to me and I'm happy to forward them to our instructor. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, he'd be happy to, uh, to respond, I think. Uh, though my father isn't a rabbi, um, he's, uh, uh, he is a great scholar of Torah and a historian. Uh, my mother is the rabbi. Yeah, people ask, what do you call the, the guy who's married to a rabbi? And the standard answer is lucky. <laughs> Uh, thanks again, uh, Jeff Spitzer, uh, and to all of you, have a good evening. I think the program is over for the evening. Okay. Well, take care. <laughs> and um, the materials are up there on Safari, and you're more than welcome to take a look at them or to go back and, and look for notes or make notes on them. And again, really worthwhile to take a look at that story of the, of, of the golden calf. Kind of fun. Um, have a wonderful evening. Yeah, you Thank week. you very much. Take care. Thanks very much. I now have a full brain. <laughs>